Hi guys, and welcome back to They Say It Takes a Village. Now, before we get started on today's incredible episode, I just want to take a little moment to give Wear That Now and their incredible team a huge shout out, particularly my girl Christelle for addressing me for today's episode. Now, if you're anything like me, occasions come and go throughout the year and picking outfits for them is particularly stressful, especially if you had, if you have to head down to the mall with little kids. So you end up driving around for hours looking for parking, dragging your little kids from store to store just to find that one outfit. That is a thing of the past because where that now have got you covered. What they do is after you fill out a style, a style survey, they will send you a curated box to fit every style, every budget, and every occasion. That box gets delivered straight to your door for you to try on the outfits in the comfort of your own home. The outfits that you love, you keep. The ones that you don't, you simply send back. So if you're anything like me, you're poor on time, but you love to make sure that your clothes are perfect, head over to at where.that.now, fill in their style survey and get paired up with one of their incredible styles. Take photos of your looks and DM me. Happy shopping. So we have a problem a huge problem, and some might call a silent epidemic. A recent study has shown that 40 to 65% of people across 100 countries have felt the weight of what we now know as burnout. Whether that's their lives are increasingly demanding, whether that's in the workplace or parenting, burnout doesn't seem to discriminate. However, the good news is Burnout can be completely manageable and potentially avoidable with the right support and support structures. So, with a topic as massive as this, I decided to bring in the big guns. Dr. Saliha Afredi, clinical psychologist and founder of Lighthouse Arabia, is here to talk to me about pet burnout, particularly parental burnout. She has become the voice of the mental health movement here in the UAE and the region. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic on to her, and I'm sure you're going to love today's episode. Dr. Saliha, thank you, and welcome to They Say It Takes a Village. Thank it's you for being really here. really my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's honestly, this has been a long time coming. We've been planning this for a while, and then life gets in the way, doesn't it? Yes, it sure does. Yeah. It sure does. But I'm happy to be here and happy to be talking about a topic that is as important as this one. Well, that's, I mean, we literally, just before we started recording, I feel as we're catching up, it's, this was a common theme, you know, sort of yeah. burnout and the, I would say the hecticness of life just seems to take over. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. As, if we are talking in particular about parental burnout, I think we have seen a rise of that in um, maternal burnout, yeah. uh, working mothers burnout, especially post-COVID. During mm -hmm. COVID and COVID, and then we are just... We haven't recovered from that even four years later because so many other things have happened, especially in the region. If you live in the region and you're a working mom, you've, you've gotten a lot of, um, you've got, you've got a lot that you've contended with in, in the last few years. But this is a global phenomena. This is not just for the region. Actually, in the region, we have a lot more support than other people do in other parts of the world. But, um, but really there was, I mean, burnout has been an issue for a decade, two decades now, but it really sort of escalated um, and became a topic that everyone was very concerned about. No more a silent epidemic. It yeah. feels like everyone's talking about it exactly. now. And it's it's um, hurting people physically and mentally enough for people to now put this on their radar and say, we've got to do something about this. And I feel, I feel before we get into it, because I've got a thousand questions to ask you, do you want to give everyone who's listening just a little bit of a background just about you and how long have you been in the UAE? And I mean, obviously you are the voice and mastermind behind Lighthouse Arabia, but I just, sure. yeah, just how long have you been? Yeah, so I am a clinical psychologist. I moved here from the U.S. Uh, 15 years ago now. 
I have four children. I oh, You have four? Yes. Oh my goodness. For some odd reason, I thought you had two. No. <gasps> How do you do it? <laughs> yeah, no, I have four children. Three of them are teenagers. Oh, uh, one is 18, applying to colleges right now. Oh. Another one is in a football academy overseas in a boarding school. And then um, I have a 14-year-old and a 9-year-old. Um, I'm married. Uh, my parents live with me. Uh, we, we, yeah, it does take it's a village. It's a full it, house. It, it's a full house. <laughs> it's a full yes, house. it's a full house. Yeah. Um, and uh, founded the Lighthouse. Uh, it's now 13 years ago. Uh, and then went on to Instagram, I would say four years ago. Mm-hmm. And actually, maybe in May, it'll be five years. Oh, wow. uh, so that was also another decision to start another community, um, but to serve the mental health needs um, of the community. And with the, with the lighthouse, our mission really was to bring um, free or, or low cost services in a, in a way that was sustainable. So we are like a social enterprise because we have over 25, uh, we have about 25 support groups running now that are led by experts that are licensed psychologists. So it's like therapeutic yeah. spaces that you can uh, avail for free. And then we also do a lot of public awareness. We do a lot of talks in schools that are free of charge um, alongside with our four fee services. That's amazing. Yeah, it yeah. is. I mean, we have a wonderful team from all around the world, and uh, we we really are trying to make a dent. I feel in the mental health. You've, you've not just made a dent; you've shifted the whole perception. To be honest, I feel like you've broken the stigmas. You've you've been so active, whether that is through Lighthouse or through you know your own personal sort of journey and your your Instagram and and all. Of, just to have that voice and normalize mental health and so important. prioritize mental health yeah yeah thank you I feel like that's when you say your name it's almost synonymous with with this type of empowerment and movement and it's it's really wonderful honestly thank you for thank a community you. like this and especially i find you know it, it can potentially be a community where no one really wants to talk about it oh yeah you know people find it they kind of push back anything that has anything to do with mental health so it must have been quite difficult Oh, it was. And everyone told me, don't do it. It's never going to work. The mental health is not something we talk talk about about. in public here. Um, and I was like, well, let me try. Mm -hmm. And, and I really, it was a naivete. It was not courage or vision or anything. It was really, truly, um, idealism that kind of got me started on that path. We still have a very long way to go when it comes to breaking down stigma, but I do think that the, the movement onto the digital world, movement of social media, um, and the popularity of such things has sort of accelerated us. So like what I did and what we did as a team in the first seven years of the lighthouse versus what we did in the next seven years because of social media and because of just our voices just going out further now because of Zoom before 2020, there was no Zooms. We weren't doing these things. So now we have people in Qatar and Saudi and Bahrain, Oman, Pakistan, India, Singapore, Korea. We are now reaching, um, people in in different parts of the world including Europe and the United States um and so all of a sudden our reach you know expanded. sort of ex- really expanded um in the last 4 years and we'll just keep going until the whole world no longer That's thinks it. that this is a a um a Almost shameful like a, thing. A shameful thing. A taboo thing. I yeah. mean, I, it's it's so weird. It is. I don't it, get it. it. <laughs> Neither do I. And I find. I think it's. Yeah. Look. I think it's the more awareness, the better. And and I think the more education, if you can reach every yeah. corner and crevice in the world, you are going to normalize it enough that people can recognize almost little red flags and get yeah. the help without it potentially spiraling out of control. Yeah. So. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And you're right. I find it's probably one of my questions, but the, 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 I guess the invention of social media and the digital world, yes. it does have, it's a double edged sword. You know, it, using it correctly can do, can move mountains in such a positive way. Whereas on the flip side, it can potentially cause a little bit more stress. Yeah. Um, and, and I most think things are. That's true. Most, most amazing things 
are yeah. um, to be used with consideration and moderation, whether you're eating or sleeping or, you know, exercising, yeah. everything mm -hmm. can be turned to and actually be harm harmful for you. Mm -hmm. But I will just go back and say one thing about this shameful thing. And I do think it's related to burnout. Um, you know, I, m a lot of my work is with men, but obviously I'm, I'm a woman and I have children and I'm a psychologist and I've made it a point to talk about, well, I have therapy. My children have therapy. Uh, my husband goes to therapy mm -hmm. and this is just us doing our reflective practice and yeah. doing the work. Um, but there were times in my life where that wasn't as easy to do. And I was already a psychologist at that time to just say that I, I, I pride myself being able to say, well, I have broad shoulders. I carry a lot mm -hmm. and I can hold a lot for people. I can do a lot for people and have been very service oriented my whole life. And so for, for me to just say, well, wait, what? I, I need help or wait what? I don't know, or I can't do this. I can't do this. Uh, that was extremely hard. So that's one thing. The next thing is that more recently, due to what's happening in our region, I started to really kind of put out my feelings out there on Instagram. And the, the, I don't, I don't, the feedback, I should mm -hmm. say, that I got as a result of that. Some people feeling sorry for me, other people feeling like, well, don't feel like this. And there were so many people telling me what to feel and what not to feel and how I should feel and, uh, you know, postpone the feeling. So the public perception of feeling is still very stigmatized. So we might say, oh, I'm stressed, I need to go to a psychologist, or oh, I'm stressed and I need to seek support. But talking about feelings or and talking about medication are two things that I feel are still, I was like, we got a long way to go. And so that's just something that I've realized now in the last three months uh, that, well, we've got we've got to talk about, well, how do you make space for that? Mm -hmm. And how do you um, how do you normalize just feeling mm -hmm. as a human being, you know? And I think this is, this is something that we are not doing just yet. So I've got a question for you. How, how do you do that? How do you work towards normalizing that, these feelings to have, is it just a matter of talking about it more? Is it the encouragement that you get, for example, starting young at schools? I mean, in your opinion, how, how would you go to normalize that? I think it takes a village. <laughs> Coming yeah, on here. Exactly. It does take a village. Yeah. Um, it cannot, it's not a, 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 a single prong a, type yeah. of solution here. Yeah. We are going to have to do it in schools. We're going to have to do it in homes. We're going to have to do it at an institutional level, at a corporate level. I mean, we, we have to come at it from every which way. Mm -hmm. Um, primary care doctors have to be trained in talking about certain things about That's mental right. health and emotional health. Um, so I think most people don't have emotional literacy. Don't, most people don't have mental health literacy. Most people use the word burnt out and depressed and anxious very flippantly. And it's like, no, that's not burnout. You're just tired. Go to sleep Go to and you will get some Take rest. Enough, yeah. And so when someone actually is burnt out, nobody really knows what to do with that. Well, so because, well, she was burnt out and she was fine. So, you know, like that's not burnout. So our, our literacy is actually not there yet either. Yeah. And so, um, that would probably be the first step to do it at every level mm -hmm. is to first make everybody literate as to what these things are. Okay. So let me now then get to that question. How would you, how would you define burnout and how does that differ? For example, is there different, is there different burnouts at different stages in your life? Could you have burnout at work and burnout as a parent? And what are the differences? Yeah. So this is a uh, complicated. It is. <laughs> I, I think if you Google burnout, you will get the World Health Organization um, definition. 
Uh, but what most people don't know that there are over 140 definitions of burnout in research. Because we're not confused enough. Exactly. <laughs> and so, um, and there's a lot of critique about burnout. Well, what is it? And it's so subjective. I'm filling out a form and that says, um, do you feel tired? Okay. Well, who doesn't, you know, like oh, find a person <laughs> yeah. who doesn't feel tired. Yeah. So there are times where it's like, well, are you talking about this week? Are you talking about this month? Are you talking about the last six months? Are you talking about every day in the last six months? So it's actually Define quite it. a complicated definition. But the, the way I look at burnout, and this is not necessarily something that you will find in e easily accessible in uh, online, but it makes the most sense to me is the polyvagal theory laid on top of the burnout. And so the polyvagal theory talks about our three states. The first one is ventral vagal. The second one is fight or flight. And the third one is dorsal vagal. Okay. So ventral vagal is when we are in our rest and digest. We're feeling good. We're feeling right. We feel open. We feel curious. We feel connected. And that is our natural state. When you see a kid and they're fed and rested and in, they've played today and they've exercised today and they've eaten right today and they hadn't had too much sugar, you just see they're playful and they're excited their and they're curious. Potentially met. All their needs are met okay. and they feel good okay. and they feel safe. That's the key word. They feel safe in their world. Now, when you are not doing all of that, when you are not sleeping properly, when you are not eating properly and moving properly or working till, you know, the wee hours of the morning, and when your system, the whole system starts to get dysregulated or when there is a potential threat in the environment or when you are worried about something or there's been a death in the family or, or you move into what is the sympathetic um, uh, system. And that is the fight or flight, which is what we all know. This is when you are stressed. And now most of us don't even know it, but we live in a chronic state of stress. Oh. We actually never really go down into ventral vagal. Even if we go down, so imagine this ladder, okay? okay? We Even if we touch ventral vagal, we're not deep in a ventral vagal state. We actually are just like calm for a minute, but then someone cuts us off on the road and we're immediately back in to a fight or flight response. Whereas if you were in a deep ventral vagal state, you are just not as reactive. And I'm sure you've had those periods in your life where like, yeah, that would have bothered me, but I'm okay right now. Mm -hmm. Like you're just not reactive. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself highly reactive, that means you are not going into a deep rested state or a deep safe state for your nervous system. Now, if you stay in that fight or flight, which most mothers, fathers, working professionals are just kind of in that fight or flight most of the time. And then there are periods where you have a six week project, or maybe you're a new mother, or you just had twins, or you just had, you know, guests and everybody and their mother show up for holidays. And, and now you are tending and tending and tending, and you are not resting and recuperating. You move into what is the third state, which is the dorsal vagal, which is shut it down. And your body just shuts it down. That is burnout. And so dorsal vagal is when you go numb, you are apathetic, you could care less. Did the kids eat? I'm sure they ate today. You know, I'm not sure what they ate, but they're alive and they're okay. Like this kind of disengagement, yeah. because going back to the World Health Organization, it talks about three hallmarks of um, burnout. And they actually qualify burnout as a workplace phenomena, which... We all know that it is not just in the workplace. Yeah. Caregiver burnout is a real thing. Parental burnout is a real thing. And so if we know that caregivers can burn out and workplace people can burn out, what is the common link here? The common link here is that our nervous system is not having time to rest, recuperate, rejuvenate, uh, re, you know, reset itself. 
And so it stays in that state until one day it tips over and says, shut it down. And then it takes you about six to eight weeks to finally bring it back online again, because you've pushed it over the edge into a state of burnout. So burnout is a serious issue when it comes to your nervous system. And it requires almost like a surgical intervention where you are dealing with it as if you are post-surgery. What would you do post-surgery? That's exactly what you're going to do to heal from burnout. And so the hallmarks, I'll go back to the World Mental Health Organization um, a definition, is that the hallmarks are emotional exhaustion, apathy, which is where you are just cynical or disengaged or you just don't care. If you're in the workplace, someone could be like, hey, listen, man, if you don't get this project right, you're going to get fired and, and you're, there you're just like and quite indifferent it's this kind of flat affect because there's no adrenaline because you've used it all so you so you can't even get yourself you know adrenaline is good yeah. some level of stress is good yeah. because it gets you to activate you can't get activated because you're depleted inside of you and then the third hallmark is that you just become ineffective you're making mistakes you're just not completing tasks you're not able to finish what you started oh i have a birthday party to plan for and you just are like okay let me just get it out of the way and but you never sh you're not showing up in the way you usually do mm -hmm. so people start to say well that's not like her or that's that's you know, something's you have, a bit off yeah something like your emails are a little bit more thorough but you're just sending okay yes no you know because you just don't have energy to give to the things that you used to so that was a very long answer no, to a very honestly, complicated... I, like, I don't know if you noticed, but I feel like my face almost dropped. Yeah. Because th the fact that one thing that you said, which is that we're in a constant state of yeah. fight or flight. Yeah. I mean, would you term that as the difference between stress and burnout, that we're constantly stressed? Because yes. as you said, yeah, yes. you, you, you basically, oh, you know, I'm a bit stressed out and I'm feeling burnt out. But that definition is not matching. Yeah. So we're a population walking and talking stressed out people, but the burnout is really when you take it to the next level. Yes. That is. And it shuts down. That is honestly. It's a protective measure for some animals, including human beings, to play dead. That's you playing dead. Because the threat is so big and I don't have the energy or the capacity right now to fight or flight. I can't fight this thing. I can't run from this thing. Play dead. And so you move into the dorsal vagal play dead. And that's your body saying, pull out. I'm disengaged. And what's happening now is that, you know, seven hours, six hours of poor quality sleep is what most people call rest these days. Yeah. And so we're not going into where our body actually feels safe, grounded, connected, open, engaged, curious, none of that. We're not getting into that state because we just have six hours to get our rest and back on to whatever it is that we're doing the next day. And all day long, all day long, all day long, all day long, we're running, 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 running. And even at traffic lights, we're checking our phone. In our bathrooms, we're checking our You're phones. So right. In our shower, we're listening to the podcast. And like, we, there's on. no You're on. rest. Yeah. And our nervous system was never designed for that we've made it on this planet for thousands of years because we moved with the sun we had a rhythm to our life we had dinner with our family every night we laughed we joked we rested when the sun went down now the advent of electricity when does the sun go down it doesn't go down we are up until the wee hours of the morning and we have bright lights in our phone uh, with our phones and our devices until those wee hours so the melatonin release isn't happening so you're not going into that deep sleep and the effects of all of that go, you know, yeah. throughout our society. Which is quite fundamental. The things that you're talking about are fundam fundamental things like sleep. Well, it has worked for yeah. many, many years. So I'm going to go with that. No, you know? but I mean, it's like, why are we trying to do something well, so sophisticated? You're not trying to invent the new yeah. wheel or invent a, the wheel or whatever it is. No, it is going back to basics on the basics. Um, and as you're talking, I'm just trying to think to myself. So as a parent, obviously, whether you are a stay at home parent or a working parent, time seems to be that runs out, you know, yeah. sort of time management is quite, quite difficult to get a hold of. So as you're talking, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well, a lot of these things, is it a matter of, you know, 
can we potentially time manage the avoidance of burnout so that we can sort of gain control of the times that we are able to switch off or, you know, carve out the time to look inwards a little bit. Is proper time management and it almost like a sort of a direct relationship to avoid burnout? The two things. Or could that add more stress? Some people think it does, but those people just don't know what time management means. Yeah. Um, and they're just, you know, resistant to the idea of, well, I don't want someone to tell me what to do. And it's like, well, that's something I don't want to work on a schedule. Yeah. yeah. And, and you will drive yourself into something at that point if you are not managing your time. So I think the two things I have been burnt out, I would say clinically twice in my life because the first time just wasn't enough. I was like, hmm, that was a fluke. And I am an adrenaline junkie. I have been my whole life. I wouldn't say anymore. I am not. I've learned um, to slow down yeah, a little. To, um, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I still have a very fast processor. So I don't know. I if think that's you just slow. operate on that. Yeah, yeah. I have a different. I have a different operating model, a different processing model. Um, but um, but I was really pushing myself beyond. Mm-hmm. I was bionic. I thought. And I didn't sleep. I slept three hours a night. I didn't eat because I just didn't need it. I, the adrenaline was enough to fuel. Um, and so I, you know, I did exercise. That was the one thing that I had um, going, but anything that was movement oriented. And so I was able to do a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, can I, while have children, while having a doctorate. This, is, a, this you know. is what I was asking. Is, was that a particular, can you sort of looking back is, can you pinpoint, was it in the sense that you felt the, the weight of the family or the work or setting up lighthouse or study or, I mean, can you pinpoint what kind of pushed you to a burnout state? I just get, you know, burnout for me, you know, I realized that the fires of passion also burn you out. Mm. I had discipline in all areas of my life. My kids had a routine. I had a routine. But I just didn't consider my body. I just was dissociated from my body. Mm. Mind over matter. And it's like, no, mind and matter both matter. Like, I was just really all about, if I can will it, I can do it. And you do have to consider that you are a human and you need rest. And so the thing that really wasn't part of the formula at that time. The discipline was there. The scheduling was there. The self-awareness of, okay, you know, what am I capable of was partially there, Mm. but the awareness did not take into the needs of the body. I just didn't do that. And I do believe many men don't do that. And many women don't do that. But but particularly men, I have noticed that they are just quite dissociated from their bodies. And my journey back to my body only came, I would say, four years ago, three years ago. So this is not like a, oh, I in my 30s, I came home or when I had my kids. Nope. Even then I was a machine and I worked like a machine. Um, But it does take a toll on your body. And that's where the two burnouts happened. Mm -hmm. So the first time around was when I was um, setting up the first lighthouse and we have version 2.0 now. And the second one was when I was setting up the second villas. And it was just, it was love for yeah. the job. It was excitement about the job. It was that I just wanted to stay up and finish mm-hmm. what I was doing. And oh, I had this talk and it was so, I was so excited like a kid. But, you know, you let the kid keep running. They'll keep running until 11 o'clock at night. Absolutely. Because they have the energy, but they don't want to stop. And so I was a bit like that, mm. quite naive um, and quite dis- disconnected from the body. And now I just listen to the body more. And so I think I'm still quite high energy and high drive. It's just that I'm now saying, okay, what did you eat? Oh no, I didn't, I didn't eat today. Or mm, I need to drink water or I need to sleep now. It's 10 o'clock, mm. you know, so I'm a, a bit more engaged with that part. So then moving you to, for example, red flags. Yeah. You know, these are physiological red flags? Yes. Okay. 100%. So, you will have emotional exhaustion. And so a lot of times people don't understand they're physiological. I mean, you know, we're quite disconnected from that. So the emotional red flags would be that you're more irritated, you can't sleep properly, or you're just tired all the time and you feel the fatigue 
sort of in your, in eyes. your eyes. Yeah. You just feel tired yeah. in like your bones, you know? So that kind of fatigue where you just don't have like, the life force yeah. is not moving you forward. It's literally like walking through thick, quick sand yeah. with every step you sink. With, yeah. Um, but irritation, anger, um, outbursts, making mistakes at work or at home, mm -hmm. leaving, you know, the keys in the car, like this kind of absent forgetfulness, yeah. you know, you're sort of absent at home. Um, so those would be some of the things that I would look for, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's at home, is that you're no longer, you don't have the life force. Yeah. You are not, you know, engaged mm. um, with the things that you used to be engaged with. Another thing could be that the things that used to give you joy don't give you joy. Nothing gives you joy. So you go out because you think, well, maybe if I go out with my friends and you're just like, why am I here? This is like, I just want to go home and sleep. But when you're in bed, you're like, I can't sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of, where do I get my energy from? Where do I get my life force from? And, and it just feels like there's nothing really that gives you that because there's nothing from the outside that will, it only will come from the inside. It's funny again, listening to a lot of the, there is, I don't know, again, pardon my ignorance, but is there commonality between burnout and depression? Yes. Yeah. They look the same. Yeah. They do look the same. It's and a lot of times yeah. where people will come with that I'm depressed. Um, and then when we start to see, okay, well, what happened? And we'll see, okay, they really are not resourced. And so it could look like depression. And that's why it's so hard diagnostically. Because if you go to a psychologist, they might give you depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a medical doctor, they might give you burnout. And if you go to a cardiologist, they might give you something else. So it's really quite tricky. This is where you need to really know. Mm -hmm. So you asked me, what are the things you need? Is time management what you need? Mm -hmm. I would say there's two things, self-awareness and time management. Mm -hmm. Because you can manage your time all day long, but if you're not aware of what your energy is on a Monday versus what your energy is on a Thursday versus what your energy is on a Saturday morning, you're not going to know how to manage that time. Mm. Time is not enough. You have to know when to schedule what. Mm. I know Mondays, I'm exhausted. Mondays are really hard for me. So that Monday morning, I'm blocked until 1 p.m. I have a schedule that allows me to do that. Mm. And if you don't have a schedule that allows you to do that, then I would do that on Sunday. And I would say take part of Sunday to recuperate from something. So that might be Sunday evening where you say in a disciplined way, I'm not looking at social media. I'm not. I'm going to go do something calming for myself. Maybe take a bath mm -hmm. or go for a walk or do some, you know, something that says I'm resetting my system and I'm going to gear up for the next day. So I have a full-fledged packed weekend most weekends because of my kids and my husband and my parents and all of that so that needs to that I don't have time on the weekend so I do that on Monday morning mm -hmm. I take that whatever eight to one p.m. You carve out that dedicated yeah. space yeah. yeah and then I also do that on Friday afternoon I try to get some of that you know maybe four hours to just say I'm going to go do this because I've got to gear up for the next two days. And I'm a deep introvert. And so anything where it's more than one person requires a lot of energy mm -hmm. from me. So I've got to gear up for the energy and I've got to, you know, re recuperate from the weekend. So those are two things that I know about myself that I'm going to block those two times on a Monday and on a Friday. Now, Monday afternoon, I'm going to take all my calls on Tuesday. Okay. That's when I'm going to be ready to go and I'm going to do all my work, you know, mm -hmm. so I know my schedule, but I'm going to say, okay, Tuesday night, no socializing because that day was full of work. Mm -hmm. So you were going to need to on Wednesday. I don't have anything in the day, so I could do Just an early dinner. Evening. So yeah. you're watching your schedule and you're saying, mm -hmm. how much energy does that take? How much energy? And there are times where I know I'm going to have a very difficult conversation that day. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing anything that evening. Mm -hmm. So my schedule, if you ask me what I'm doing on a, you know, Friday, the, you know, you know, February 15th, I will tell you what I'm doing fr February 15th because I, if it's a Tuesday or a Wednesday, it will be determined and Obviously, 
for the most part, I can plan. Now, the higher up you go or the more children you have or the more dependents you have, leave a lot of white space yeah. in your schedule. So most people are like, oh my God, I can't schedule every hour of my day. No, you shouldn't. You should have a lot of white spaces because crisis will come. Yeah. So I am the managing director of the lighthouse and I, it all falls on me. Right. And so I have a beautiful team, a supportive team, but the buck stops with me. And so I need to know that when crisis calls and everybody else might be looking to you, look, you know, or they might be on their own posts or they might have clients, I'm going to have to step in. And so there's a lot of times where I might make a commitment on February 15th, but I might say with that, that, Hey, listen, this is four weeks out. I'm just letting you know crisis may call and I might need to reschedule. And so some of that needs to be built in. So I've learned my rhythm. I've learned my energy. I've learned what reboots me quickly. The sun is like, I'm literally solar powered. So if you put me in the sun for an hour, it's almost as if I have you had recharge. a whole day of charge. So what recharges you? What depletes you? What drains you, which is different from, you know, exhausts you. Um, there are things that just suck the life out of you. Okay. What are those? Cause you're going to need two days of recovery after that, yeah. you know, and maybe it's like some complicated relationships or, you know, something. And so these are things that are going to be very important. Time management without energy management is nothing. And energy management can only happen effectively if you know yourself. So it all starts with who am I? And and I think the thing that gets in the way is that we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people. Like, you know, Dr. Saleh has four kids and she can do that. And so I can do that. It's like, no, you don't know what the what support structure Dr. Saleha has. You don't know how she's trained that support structure or what resources that she has that you might not have. So you have to go based off of your resources, your infrastructure, mm -hmm. your finances, mm -hmm. you know, and then say, Okay, I think I can. And your mental health. Uh, you know, maybe you've had a death in the family and Dr. Saleh is not contending with that. And so grief, especially if you're contending with grief, and as many of us are right now, that will take up 60% of your energy. Absolutely. And now you've got 40 to work with, you know? So how are you going to manage that? And what are you going to eliminate off your schedule when it comes down to, you know, grief or other times in your life. These are all considerations as you look at your schedule and you plan yeah. because most people don't look at that. And then they're pushing themselves mm -hmm. to do something. And when you are pushing yourself that hard, something's going to break. That's right. Is that what you do when a, a, a sort of a patient walks in, you know, to have a, you literally will sit down and look at their schedule? Yeah. For the, I mean, I will say how much control and auto do autonomy do you have? Most of my work is with senior executives. Mm. And uh, right now that's who I'm working with. That's my clientele. Um, and so they have some autonomy, whereas some others who work within the government sector, um, whereas ministers, for example, they don't have as much autonomy. So it, you know, it depends, it, it depends but for the first, one of the first questions I have is how much do you sleep? What are your tech habits? What's your autonomy as it relates to your schedule? How much command do you have of that? How much control do you have of that? And then I, I say, okay, what are we going to jig here? Um, because I can talk to you all day long about your mental health, but if your body ain't rested, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to even apply what I teach you. When we don't get seven to eight hours of sleep every night, anything less than seven hours is considered sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. When you are sleep deprived, you are 60% more reactive. Now, I can teach you coping skills and ACT yeah. and DBT and CBT and all these <laughs> other therapeutic techniques, but you have 60% less control that day. And you know, you've had those days where you wake up and you're like, Oh, today is going to be one of those days. I'm just, You're like uh, kicking the door, the dog, the kid, anything yeah. that comes, you know, yeah. in, in front of you. Um, and that, um, and that's because you're just not rested. Mm. Now it doesn't matter what psychotherapeutic techniques you have in that, in your pocket at that point, you won't be able to utilize anything because your body is not rested. So really it is about going back to the basics. Be super, super protective. I call them non-negotiables. Mm. 
These are non-negotiables. Mm-hmm. Everything else we can negotiate. But this, your body, your health. And the sad thing is that once you do tip it over, it's really hard to come back from certain things. Absolutely. You know, like once you have diabetes, I, I believe in the power of the body to heal itself, but like, it's going to be a whole lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder than if you were to take those preventable steps, yes. which are small tweaks to your life to have potentially sidestepped it. Yes. Now, I know rest is an important one. Parents tend to struggle with it a lot, especially sleep. You know, when it comes to sort of raising a young family, I'm sure, I mean, with four kids, you know, that, that, that they're quite famous for not letting parents sleep. How, how do you negate, how do you sort of nurture an environment where you're not being pushed over the edge as a parent dealing with the, the, the demands of parenting, demands of work, your own life demands, other dependents, whatever it might be. How can you find a balance? Is it a matter of, like you said, I carve out that four hours, you know, if, you know, that person's lucky enough to have a little bit of outside help, get in, you know, a nap if you can. Is it just, how does a parent with young children prioritize these quite fairly fundamental, you know, um, things like sleep and good nutrition or exercise. I'm not really talking about like the newborn because again, that's, I feel you're probably at that. What was the one that you said that was above the The dorsal, the dorsal, not necessarily, not necessarily the newborn. If you do that right, it can be a very beautiful time. Yeah, It's very definitely is, but it doesn't mean, I mean, you might be stressed or not sleeping properly but if you have good support whether it's your mother your sister your friends your community it can be a very beautiful time Mm. so no i think what has happened is that we have forgotten who we are Mm. we have forgotten that for thousands of years on this planet we survived and we made it because we lived in a village because we lived in a community that village is not just for a kid that village is for the mother also and that village is for the father the community the tribe everything belonged to each other the land belonged to each other so i didn't desecrate your land and you you knew that that was yours and that was mine and what was yours was mine and what is mine is yours so if it's my kid you're going to also be looking out for that kid and there are some communities right now on this planet that do still live like that, Mm. that they believe that what is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. Mm. Your pain is mine and my pain is yours. I will not carry this alone. And that way, that burden is not only on me. So that's what's happened. We, because of globalization, because of cap, you know, capitalism and urbanization urbanization and all of these things, that is what is corrupted Mm. our system so if you have that there's no reason why a new mother would feel of course you will be tired Mm. of course you will you know have sacrificed so much Mm. but it doesn't have to put you in dorsal vagal it's just we forgot who we were it's so funny you said that because it's exactly what it is you know with a new mother in a potential village or the proverbial village, the fact that, you know, she is in this, again, this little bubble with her baby and you've got so many people potentially providing food, taking the baby, helping her feed, doing all of this so she can prioritize rest. It's, it's an ancient. So a lot of the times I think it happened, um, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, that sitting in period, yes, you know, to, to help recover and, and recuperate after birth. And, but, we've moved so far from so that far. that it's become almost no one's got time for it and i i specifically fell into that trap i had a baby and it was almost like when is my life going to get back to normal mm. quick 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 it's baby's about a month old yeah it's never number one never going to go back to normal your life's changed in wonderful ways and ways that you should potentially feel a bit sad that you have to say goodbye to but it's almost like this hurry where is that that Ability to be still, be still in that particular moment with a baby, focusing on that, not checking an email if you are potentially working or, but it's again, it's so difficult and it's so easily said than done. But I think that's where we are today. And it's 
almost having to unlearn all this modernization of the world. Yes. You know? Yes. I think that is this idea of normal mm. has changed. Yes. I want to get know, my normal life back. What is normal? And who decides that that? And what, who decides the pace of life? And why did you sign up for that? Why did I sign up for that? And why have I not signed up for this? Do I have a choice? Like, I think sometimes you forget that we have a choice in certain things. You know, I feel really disheartened and uh, angry as to what the school system is doing to our kids right now. The pressure that these kids are in or, you know, that that's placed on them as they enter the most vulnerable time of their life. 50% 50% of all mental health issues start at the age of 14. Wow. And that's when this hellish schedule begins for them. 50% at 14 and 75% by the early 20s. So between high school and college, they are, they are most vulnerable because that's when the brain is developing in going through myelination and pruning and all of the other things that could expose them or trigger them into having that gene kick on that might be for depression or anxiety. And when are they under the most amount of pressure? And when do they go on social media? And when do they find out about, you know, potential climate, our climate, you know, world going up in flames? And when do they find out about the wars that are going on? Right at that time. And so this for me makes me very upset. And so, yeah, there are certain things that I feel like, well, I don't want to sign up for that. And so I told my kids, you don't, you, I'm not putting you on social media. You're not going to go. You don't have it. And I educated them. I taught them. I showed them documentaries. I sent them research articles. I'm not being a dictator here no. that is punitive, that doesn't want you to have friends. I'm going to protect you for as long as I can. And then I'm going to get you to the other side where your brain is a bit stronger that can tolerate some of these pressures. Because who defined what a good mother is? Absolutely. Who defined that a mother should have to do it alone? Who said oh, this is like it this is the the premise of everything. You know, that and naturally, as as you're saying that, what happens is guilt starts to creep yeah. in. And guilt is born, I honestly feel the moment a mom has a baby, for some odd reason, yeah, guilt. We have is a born. guilt switch, it goes on. I'm not enough, I'm not doing enough. They deserve more. Why, you know, why did I sleep? Why did I not cook the right food? And 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 you're always comparing yourself to someone's highlight reel or someone's really good day or someone who really looks like they have it all together, but you know they don't because no one does, you know, like, but we, our mind, you know, this, the, the, it plays tricks on us because of what we see. And what we really see is everyone and their mother just looking like they really got it all together. That's true. And then you're like, well, I don't feel like that. And I don't look like that. And my kid ain't going to that college. Like, where did I go wrong? But it's like, but where did you go right also? Like you raised kids that made it through without having any big mental breakdown. I was like, I think maybe I should get a medal for that one. I was so, going to say, I'm like, know? that's hard enough as it is. But how, for me, I think the biggest question was who defined what a good mother is for you? When I started asking myself that question, who is a good mother? What is a good mother? Find me the right definition. And I will challenge that because a good mother is what their child needs. A good mother is who can have a home that is happy and comforting and safe. A good mother is who will show up for her children in whichever way they need. Like, right? We, the list can go on and on and on and on. But nowhere on there it says the good mother is who picks up their kid from school or a good mother is. It might be something you put on that list, but if that doesn't work for you, you have to make your own list because a good mother is the one who goes to work and provides for her children if she's a single mother. And you may not be able to pick up your kids, but let go of the guilt. And I think for me, that the, the defining of that was very difficult. Because it was like, oh, this is uncharted territory I'm venturing off into because I'm not crazy, you know, tiger mom with my children. Like, I felt very scared to do that because in a world where everyone seems to be doing that, I was like, well, what if my kids just 
amount to nothing then, you know, and then what do I do? Are you talking to some, you know, my inner fears? Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Do I need to be stronger? I mean, my, my oldest is six. Yeah. They're very little and my youngest is three, but it's that. Should I put them in more extracurriculars? Yeah. Should I do, you know, this crazy math thing? And, but it is because I'm thinking, oh, I, you know, it's a competitive world. I want to prepare them. Yeah. But it's, do I, I mean, I kind of just want them to be happy and get through life without a major mental breakdown. Yeah. I want them to feel comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. Essentially, that's what I want. But it's that pressure. That pressure. And it's not him giving me the pressure. Mm. It's me projecting it. Yeah. Which is something that it's only now, literally now, and it's almost 11. It's that type of, oh God. I should really take the pressure off. You said, for example, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, dropping the kids off. I make it a point, despite the fact that I had a recording with you, got up at 5.15 this morning, just because I didn't want anybody else to drop them off. Why? Mm, Why? I'm going to pick them up later. But as you're talking, I was like, oh my God, it's literally. It's really, why are you doing it? And I I salute the mothers who do cook. And I salute the mothers who do pick up their kids. I salute. But that's their life absolutely and it may not be your life no, i know and your life could look different and your home could look different now i'm all about yes we do have to sacrifice as mothers and fathers yes the onus is on us to have emotional maturity mm-hmm. so don't play your child game mm-hmm. you have to be the grown-up here mm-hmm. yes you have to have discipline and boundaries and rules within the household mm-hmm. so i'm not this kind of laissez fair. Mm-hmm you know, mother. And yes, you have to have high expectations. You gr- bring me this project. Is this the best you can do? Because that doesn't look like your best. And so, no, that wasn't my best. It's challenging okay. as opposed to pressure. Yes. Yeah. So high expectations. My kids know that if this is not your best, I'm going to give you the truth here. But high support, where if I see that my daughter like this is high school. She's taking AP classes. She has college applications. If I see that, okay, she's teetering on something here. Okay. What can I take off your plate? I mean, what, what, what do you need that I can take off of your plate that you don't have to do? Um, and so it might be that she doesn't, you know, go to the gym that day, but she goes for a walk instead. You know, like what can we do that supports you at this time? So I'm watching you and tell me what you need. And okay, I'll get you a tutor for this. So you don't feel like you have to do this alone. Mm -hmm. So this is where, okay, where do you need me? I can't take away. I cannot take you out of school and I cannot make you not take AP classes and, 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 but I can give you all the scaffolding that you need in order to make sure that you're, you've got this right. I'll get you your favorite food. I'll get you, you know, making I'll sure sit that with you while you eat it. Right. I'll, you know, listen and to I you. Do, bounce I, have off ideas. Yeah. I have done that. I have literally canceled work because she needed to study for something and I just needed to be present with her. She Silently. didn't even need me. Yeah. I was quiet, but it was like, I've got you. You're not in this alone. And so there are times when I've needed to do certain things. So high expectations, high support. That's the type of parenting. And that's what we need from ourselves too. Mm. I'm not like, oh, I don't want to pick up the kids because I don't feel like it. No. no. Like if you should go pick up the kids, yes. if you, you know, yeah. like this is not about feeling. No. I think if you are feeling driven, then you could really be quite undisciplined. Mm. But my schedule, okay, four days out of the week, I can not pick her up, but I can drop her off or I can, you know, so I'm constantly saying on Wednesday, Salama, I'm going to come pick you up. And so that day, it allows me for that. And it's a good time. Yeah. We talk get to in each the car, other. Listen yeah. to music. And, and I make it, it a pleasurable experience yeah. as opposed to quickly, quickly get in the car, get out. And I've got to go because yeah. I have a meeting right, right after this and, or I'm taking a call while I'm in the car with her. So I block off an hour and it becomes a thing that I do with her. And so you you have to have those high expectations of yourself as a mother or father, um, employee, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also make sure that you feel supported in that. And there's no one that might support you. In the end, you are the one who has to give yourself permission. That's so powerful. Honestly, I feel like light bulb moments throughout this entire talk. I feel yeah. like I need to sit down with myself for yes. a second because you do see, I mean, this was, I guess, my, you know, the the next question, because you do see signs, you know, the tiredness and the 
predictability and things. And you kind of chalk it up to, oh, it's just life. Oh, oh it's just it's not life. Oh, it's just work. And you kind of sweep it under the rug really, really quickly before you can actually have a moment to address it. Yeah. And that's the scary part to yeah. sit with it for a minute and, and really have a look at what's going on. Because again, we're quite avoidant, aren't we? As people, we just, or we lose the big picture. Yeah. On your deathbed to be, you know, to put it really in stark, you know, yeah. ways. Um, will you have said, you know, I wish I worked more. Will you say that, oh, I wish I signed up my kid for more classes? Or will you say that I wish, you know, I did more, like uh, more projects? No, you will say, did I love enough? Was I present enough? Was I good to my people around me? Was I a good friend? Are there people that are going to miss me on this planet? Are there people that are going to, you know, say that she touched my life? You know, you can give to everybody and, you know, everybody gets just a superficial version of yeah. you, or you can do it right with your people. And what are, what does that mean for you? And how do you show up for that? And I cannot show up right for anyone unless I am feeling right in me. Absolutely. So what do I got to do for me? And this is where I prioritize my oxygen mask. I prioritize my care because I've got to be right. And there are times where I'm so tired, but I'm still going to take my mom to that doctor's appointment and that's okay. And those are moments you sacrifice for your parents and for your children and for your people. But for the most part, I want to show up where they see my eyes sparkle and I'm interested in my father's stories and I'm interested in my kids' stories rather than, oh God, please just stop talking. Like, <laughs> because I'm, you know, you don't want to show up like that. And people, people do feel it. Because I mean, they're yes, taking you are a there, box. As, yeah. you know, physically there, but you're not really there. No, yeah. you're not. And that's, and everyone picks up on it, whether it's even children. Of course. You know, it's sort of, you know, he'll repeat a story. And if I'm kind of half listening, he would be like, mom, did you, did you hear what I just yes. said? And it's like, oh, yes, of course. Yeah. But that's it. And it's, it's, I think what most people struggle with. Yeah. You know, there's, um, somebody once told me that, let's say, for example, you've had a long day at work and there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, balance, balance is the key. Balance in life is what you need to do. You need to give 10% here and a 10% there and 10% there. What would you say to that? No. No. <laughs> no. It's balancing. Yeah. There's no such thing as balance. And there are times when I give my kid 90% and everyone else gets 10 because she just needs it that day. And as a tribe, we need to show up for her right now. She's going through a, a tough time in her academic career. So 90% from all of you guys, because she needs 500%, you know? And so how do you sacrifice and how do you show up fully? And then there are times where my work gets 90% and my kids, you all good? Yeah. Dad, you got them? Like, you know, and so yeah. they know that they have a working mom. She's on a mission. She's doing something important. And this is, you know, important to her. Absolutely. So, but that 10%, oh, it's going to be as if it was a hundred mm -hmm. because I'm fully focused. I'm not distracted by my phone. I'm going to be with them. I'm going to laugh with them. I'm going to engage with them. So that maybe it's a one hour mm -hmm. session that I have mm -hmm. with them that day, but that one hour is going to be, I'm all yours. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's when we think we're just kind of drifting, you know, and that, I think this idea that you have to give everybody equal, it doesn't work. No. You give where it's most needed. And then for the others, you give them exactly all of that time. So it becomes very important and meaningful. So it's that, you know, and, and what has the biggest bang for the buck, right? And so for me, it would be that, okay, if I have to now look, I have four kids. I've got to divide some time. I'm, okay. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give her. Friday and I'm going to give them to him Tuesday and I'm going to go to his game, but he doesn't even really see me on the game and he doesn't really like it when I come. So actually I'm going to, you know, so what does he need? And I'm going to give him exactly that. So it feeds him. So what is his love language and how can I speak that when he needs it? Right. And so not everybody has the same love language and your kids don't, your husband doesn't, your wife doesn't. Um, and so learning everybody's language and speaking to that it actually can go a long way. So 
It's a balancing act. Absolutely. And you're constantly, constantly evaluating. Last week was very different from this week. And the week before that was very different. So every week, it's like an updated iOS that needs to happen. Not yeah. a one size fits all. Oh, no. And no. it's not a one time Thing. and one and done. No, no. Yeah. It's almost like you're a magician. I mean, when you, when you talk about the four kids and lighthouse and your mission and, and everything, it's how do you get time for self care? Oh, yeah. And oh, you yeah. prioritize. I mean, it. This is what I mean. Like today, be, you know, <laughs> I go to bed early. Yeah. I wake up early. That morning hour is mine. I do what I want. I drink coffee as slowly as I want and nobody's talking to me. And then six o'clock comes and we are on, you know, and my daughter comes in and I might be getting ready and we have a whole conversation. And then another daughter walks in and I have another conversation. And then I sit outside with my son and, you know, so that six to seven hour is theirs mm -hmm. and they see me fully engaged and fully present with them and then off they go to their different schools and you know and then my work begins and so there are you know there are definitely you know an eight to nine usually is with my husband and then I might do a workout and you know etc yeah. etc so it really um and it each day looks different but that first hour of the day is mine like like I will lock myself up in the bathroom or the closet and it's just like mine yeah it's that moment to reset yeah and they almost prepare you yeah for whatever's going to be thrown at you yeah. from six to seven or, yeah. or the rest of the day i think this kind of rushing in the yeah. morning is like sort of no. getting up from like zero to a hundred yeah no give that even if it's like having to set your alarm slightly earlier yeah just to give that little start only if you sleep early only if you sleep yeah I and think if you, if you are, you know, sometimes you'd be like, oh, be part of the 5 a.m. club. I Don't be part of the 5 a.m. club if you ain't part of the 10 p.m. club. Absolutely. Because you need that sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I go to bed 10 p.m. And latest will be 1030. Mm -hmm. um, and so that it allows me to wake up early. I have not used an alarm since I was in college. I don't and unless I have a flight at two in the morning. But my body just does it needs it wakes up when it wakes up and there are times where it wakes up at six and i'm like hmm that's interesting i was a little like, extra tired yeah, today yeah i, was, I needed that. i needed it but there's a buffer there yeah. you know for, of that one hour mm -hmm. so i didn't slowly wake up but i rested mm -hmm. and i still had time to sort of have a sit and chat with my kids and have my coffee, but not like wake up at eight and run out the door Absolutely. by eight thirty and yeah. this kind of rush, rush. No, the the rush, especially in the morning. Um, yeah. I find it quite chaotic, and it sort of sets up the day to be chaotic. Yes. Whereas a nice slow start. Yeah. It's sort of everything. A rhythmic start. A rhythmic start. Yeah. It really does have a nice flow to the rest. I've definitely noticed that, especially if it was more so. Now I'm only now getting a little bit of a, a rhythm. Yeah. Um, I always sort of go between, you know, the kids go to bed fairly early. I mean, they're quite young. So by seven. So I've got from seven to let's say 10. Sometimes, you know, it's, you know, you get this push, whether it's, you know, it's time for me to go to bed and I am mindful of it, but oh, I really want to watch an extra, you know, 45 yeah. minutes of whatever. Or, you know, me and my husband were having a chat and I always, again, I don't overthink it. If it does run a little bit extra, I might be tired the next day and the next day I'll go to bed my regular timing. Yeah. So, but it yeah. is within. It's within that limit. Within that limit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it is very important. I yeah. think that just, that sort of sets you up to almost tackle it all. You know, the yeah. good, the, the bad doesn't become catastrophic and the good, I feel like I just, I'm always looking to be on that even keel. Yeah. You know, nothing too high, nothing too low, just. Enjoying yeah. it at a pace where it is enjoyable, as opposed to this going this yeah. up and down in feelings. I find that dysregulates me yeah. in a big way. Hundred percent. Um, quick tips. Yeah, tips. Aside. So we know going to bed. Yeah, quite early. Exercise. You know, eating right. You know, again, is it as simple as that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah, you have to live as our ancestors lived. Yeah. If you're not getting sunlight every day, if you're not moving every day, if you're not eating from the earth and you're eating processed foods and fried foods and, you know, dead food, um, if you are not resting every day, move with the sun as much as possible, eat with the sun as much as possible. So wake up and stop eating when the sun sets. Sense. Like it's actually like move with the clock, move with the circadian clock, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
try to schedule your life in such a way that it moves with that. So those would be the basics. Now, there are certain things that I've done in the recent past where, for example, I um, stopped driving two years ago. Like I just started to take Ubers or I have a driver or a taxi or whatever. Um, and I just used that time to just breathe or work or make my phone calls or do whatever it is that I need to do because that's like that's really quality time Absolutely. that I could be doing something meaningful which could be meditation I meditate in the back seat if I know it's a 20 minute drive put in my headset and do my meditation so now that's done so I'm using that time which I would have used for driving to now do something more productive, productive yeah, yeah. or, or helpful, I should say. Do you know also driving is a stressor? Is a very stressful yeah. thing. We can't like the images that we're taking in and the decisions. By the time I get to work, I've made, I've, you know, we have a decision bucket inside and I've used half of it. And so I'm tired of yeah. making decisions by, oh, turn this way, turn that way. That's why we tend to take the same roads and do the same thing is because we don't want to make as many decisions. And so if you get stuck in traffic or if there's some accident, now you've used up so much cortisol. Now you're stressed. So that's one thing that I've started to do. I still have a car. I still drive. But for the most part, I'm going to avoid doing that as much as possible. Another thing that I have, I mean, uh, like I've done since the age of 18, which has allowed me to live the life that I have lived, is I schedule everything. I literally schedule showers and blow dry and, and call mother and, you know, go out with friend and every move I make. Now people would be like, Oh my God, that's too restrictive. No, but this is how I get done with everything in my life. Of course, I'm looking at energy Absolutely. and I'm saying, okay, I have to see these friends make a list of these. Okay. I'm going to put her in on here. I'm going to go out for a walk there. Like, so I'm trying to, um, I, 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 I schedule, I, I mean, I schedule sometimes years out. And this is what I did in my doctoral program. I even scheduled having childbirth. I mean, you know, cause I didn't, I had to go back to school. So it needed to be really planned to the T as much as I could. Yeah. Um, and so scheduling, if you don't know it, learn it, hire someone, get coach, do what you need to do, but that will give you freedom. I feel free because I have a schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, I think those would be probably two big things. Um, sleep, I take very, very, you know, um, Seriously. and then I try to double up wherever I can. And so I might wear a face mask while I meditate, or I might be in the back of a car and I meditate. And so where can I do two things where I'm getting somewhere, but still doing something restful? And then I try to have, you know, five minute, um, breaks in between meetings so i won't run from one thing to the next yeah, i need to reset one. it's three five minutes do a body scan mm -hmm. go make a cup of tea look out the window no no checking of instagram um and then i would also say really 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 manage your social media habits um don't do it first thing in the morning don't do it last thing at night don't do it in the middle of the day so you really only have very small windows yeah. uh, but schedule it when you're going to do it, what you're going to do before, what you're going to do after, especially with some of the graphic stuff that at you might moment. be um, seeing at the moment, you've got to have a method uh, for social activism on social media. So before you've got to do some healing and meditation and prayer and shaking and tapping and then engage. And then what are you going to do after, which is going to be the same thing where you can release some of that voltage. That's actually really helpful because like you said, with events that are happening in the world at the moment, that's become um, something that's caused a lot of honest grief yeah. and pain. And a lot of the times it is, you know, you want to be as active as possible because that's, you know, that's where you feel that you are going to make a change. And yes. it's, it's having that time that is going to be probably even more productive to, to again, go through social media and, be aware of what's going on and 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 engage with what's happening, but in the times that is not going to have a knock on effect to what's happening tomorrow. Yes, um, in your life, and yes, that's a very important point. I've, you know, a lot of people have have potentially said that there's even apparently there's like a little timer and like yeah. a limit that you can then just say, "Yep, I'm gonna 
go on yeah. and I'm going to do what I need to do because it's true. You know, sometimes you get engrossed in it, um, in every aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and no, there it, has to be a methodology. Yeah. There has to be a discipline for social activism because that will also burn you out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I wanted to touch on and I didn't last one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, when it comes to, um, co-parenting, co-parenting and potential burnout, is there sort of a one advice that you would give parents who, let's say parents who have had a divorce, um, and they want to do their best for their child, but within the realm of their possibilities. Is there, is it a, a matter of having a conversation with your co-parent and just, you know, having that awareness sort of brought up to them saying that this is the task that I'm going to potentially do? Is it almost like sharing a schedule? I mean, what is your number one tip for that? So co-parent for divorce. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I would say to people that are going through a divorce, that it's not about you or your ex-partner, but it's about the children. Yeah. And so you really have to be bottom up, meaning go with the kid and start from there. What do they need? And then how do you divide that between the two? I think we can start to become quite ego, egocentric. We can become quite wounded. Uh, then we use children as pawns and then things get really messy. Um, so the number one rule for co-parenting is that you are no longer married, but you are still a family. Mm -hmm. And that you have to find a way to work through because the kid deserves a family, even if those two parents are no longer married. Mm -hmm. You are kin and you cannot cut from kin now that you have this child. And so you've got to find a way, go heal your wounds, go do your work. Both parents, if you want your child to grow up with some semblance of what a healthy relationship could potentially be. You don't have to stay married, but you do have to raise a child together. Mm -hmm. So really, I would say, put it on the mom and dad to go do your work and therapy and et cetera, et cetera. Even co-counseling, I would say, because co-parenting requires counseling sometimes. So go in there with the agenda of child care rather than how do we make our relationships work? How do we make our relationship work for the sake of the child? Yeah. Um, and when you sort that out, everything usually sorts itself out. It falls into place. Yeah. yeah. Just to have but I think the most important thing is that sometimes people think that, oh, well, he's divorced and I'm divorced and, and we're no longer. It's like, no, you're kin for life. Absolutely. And there's there shouldn't be sort of a imbalance of responsibilities or whatever it might be. Yeah. It is a shared responsibility that yeah. child is half- Mom, yeah. half dad. Yeah. 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 And and maybe not half and half, but you do what you're good at and Absolutely. I'm going to do what I'm good Absolutely. at. Absolutely. What are your right? strengths and play yeah. to that? And sometimes the, the father is the financial provider. And so when you know that is going on, then you are going to have different. So it may not be equal, but it will be equitable. It will be um, something that, you know, um, a, you know, looks at both people's lives and what their capacities are and what their strengths are. Once you map that out, then I think it's 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 easier yeah. to yeah. do the work. Brilliant. I feel like I can keep you in here for the next two hours, but I know I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring you back in for the next episode. But I wanted, I usually sort of, I end the episode with a bit of a quote that sort of gives context to what we had potentially talked about for the full hour. So mine is time. They say time to relax is when you don't have time for it. Mm. Mm. And I wanted to ask you what yours would be. Mine every day is the same thing is remember who you are. Mm. That's and remember what you are. Sometimes when I feel very um, sort of stuck in this 3D world, I remember that I'm a spiritual being um, and so that is an important part of this. So remember who you are. Remember what you are. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for this. It was honestly the most valuable talk I find. I mean, again, I, I can only speak for myself and I'm sure everyone who's listening is is going to feel almost the exact same. But it's having that realization that you need, it doesn't need to be a huge life change in order for you to look after yourself. It's small tweaks, which are very much attainable and can be done to be able to avoid something as 
serious as burnout. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sure. coming on. Can I just say one last thing yeah. after you said that? Because I was like, hmm, I maybe should have said this. The older you get, and if you've done the earlier parts right, you will have to say um, no to the things you want to say yes to. So you're not, it's not like you're saying no to the things that you don't like. And that's really hard. Mm -hmm. Growing up means you have to say no to the things you would love to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And that really becomes about priorities at that time. So I just wanted to say that bit because, because that has been the hardest part for me when I realized finally when I was human and I had to say no. But I really, really want to do wanted it. it. It was such an awesome opportunity. And oh my God, this could be so great for me. And then I was like, but I have to say no, because if I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? And that was my kids, or that was my sleep, or that was something that I couldn't compromise. So it was like, I'm going to say no to that. And that becomes a little bit easier. So if I say yes to this, what do I say no to? And when that will set you straight. So hopefully. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's the, the power to say no, but it's funny that you put it in that context. Like to say no to something that you really want to do. Yeah. Takes a lot of practice. It's, it's really very difficult. Yeah. I can imagine because you naturally will be like, absolutely. This is amazing. Yeah, this is 100%. Amazing. But then like you said, that's I'm saying out. no to something else. Yeah. And then you burn out. Yeah. That was how I burned out. So <laughs> you're saying a, a little bit more no's then. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you said yes to this. I'm very appreciative. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, you for so having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to They Say It Takes a Village. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I look forward to bringing you another one next week. Don't forget, please subscribe, rate, and review so I can reach and help even more parents. And if you've got a topic that you'd like me to cover, please head over to my Instagram page, it takes a village.me and drop me a line.